I am in the process of working on a report in order to analyze the results from a two-factor study. The two factors in this case are the dosage of a vitamin C, low, medium, and high, and the method of administration, whether it is a direct administration of vitamin C through ascorbic acid or if it was indirect through orange juice. I've done the graphical displays and the descriptive analysis. Now I'm going to start looking at inference. Now, if you looked at my tetrads that I created and thought, wait a minute, don't you create tetrads only if you find that there's a significant omnibus interaction? That is, that you find that there's an omnibus interaction that you can infer to the population? And the answer is, yes, those tetrad confidence intervals I will only create if I'm inferring an interaction to the population unless I plan them in advance. And in this case, I'm actually looking on an exploratory nature at this study. So I am going to do the omnibus test before I go to the contrast. But when I'm doing description, I can still talk descriptively about the tetrads. Whether or not I make confidence intervals for those is going to depend upon the results of my omnibus interaction. If I had done planned comparisons, that is, I planned out in advance that I was only interested in looking at each of the specific comparisons, not looking at the overall omnibus, then I could go ahead and go straight to confidence intervals, assuming, of course, I've met the conditions for valid inference. Regarding those conditions, let's go ahead and take a look at those now. So I'm going to enter in a code chunk here and enter in some commands that will allow me to look to see if I have normality of residuals and homogeneity of variance of residuals. I also have a condition of independence of observations, but that comes from the design of the study, not from my statistical analysis. So here I've entered in results from an AOV model and then plotting the results. First plotting my first plot, which is looking at homogeneity of variance. You know, of course, that I can go back and look at my descriptive statistics, specifically the standard deviations, to help me with that just as much as the plot will. But the plot gives me a visual display of whether I see a lot of discrepancy in terms of the, um, the variation among the conditions. Now, I have two conditions here stacked up on one line, so it's really hard to distinguish. If I use the criteria of no more than four times the largest variance and the smallest variance, that is, they're no different than a factor of four, then I'm probably okay. My smallest variance here is, let me go ahead and just calculate what the variance is. It's the standard deviation squared, so that would be 6.32. The 2.51 is my smallest. My largest is right beneath it here, the 4.798. And I notice that this largest, the smallest variance is less than four times uh, the four times the smallest variance is less than the largest variance is what I'm saying, or more than the largest variance. So uh, saying that again, I have a smallest variance of six, uh, a largest variance of 23, six times four is more than 23. So I'm within that factor of four. So I'm going to go ahead and not worry about that particular condition. I'll make some statements about that now. I state that figure three is a plot of residuals versus fitted values for the model. And as noted with the standard deviations, there are some differences in sample variances, but these are to be expected with sample data and are not large enough to cause concern about inference. So this is figure three, not four. And I've also gone ahead and put echo equals false for this code chunk so it doesn't show up. Let me go ahead and see how things are looking right now. 
Okay, so that looks pretty good. So that handles my residuals versus fitted plots to look at equality of variances. Now I need to look at the normality of residuals. So let me go back here and create another code chunk. And this time I'm going to do the second plot. So I can just copy this over and do a second plot. And as I look at that second plot, I notice that I am pretty good starting at the top all the way down until I get below a theoretical quantile of negative one. And at that point, I have standardized residuals that are larger, have a larger standard, uh, a larger z-score, a larger standardized score than um, I would have expected for normality, which could slightly influence, I say slightly because it's on one tail and not the other, but it could slightly influence my type one error rates. I'm not gonna be as concerned about this if this, I can trust the central limit theorem here, and the central limit theorem can always be trusted, but the question is, do you have enough scores? Since this is not too far from normality, and I have 60 scores, I feel like I'm going to be in pretty good shape in terms of normality of residuals in the sampling distribution, not the not the original distributions, but in the sampling distributions. So let me go ahead and put some narrative in about that. So I have stated that figure four is a normal QQ plot. This plot suggests the residuals are not normally distributed in the tails of the distribution. That is outside the middle two thirds, this middle two thirds of the distribution here. So the discrepancies are not great. The sample size is 60, so I still believe that inferential results will be valid. Let me go ahead again and check how things are looking here to make sure I didn't miss anything in terms of formatting. And I did. I didn't turn off the last code chunk, so let me go ahead and do that. All right, now that I believe I have reasonably met the conditions for valid inference, it's time for me to do those inferences. And so let me start with the omnibus analysis. I have entered in the following text. To consider whether these experimental results can be inferred to the larger population of guinea pigs, I conducted an analysis of variance. Table two is the analysis of variance for odontoblast length as a function of delivery method, dose, and the interaction of these two factors. The interaction observed in the sample can be inferred to the population, see here, P equals 0.02, and I actually should have that italicized, so I will do that. So this will be the focus of the remainder of this report. And here I have a caption for table two, and here's the table. If I go ahead and knit this, we can see how it looks down here. So we do have an interaction that can be inferred to the larger population. Because that interaction can be inferred to the larger population, I'm going to go ahead and create confidence intervals for each of the contrast. If I was actually preparing this for publication, I would use a package to make tables. Again, my favorite is GT because I don't like the fact that this is showing now tooth growth dollar sign sup for supplement. There's some other things I could do in base R, uh, but it's a little bit convoluted in order to get this to look nice and I'd rather use a package. So I'm just gonna let this be for now as my table. All right, let me build those confidence intervals now. I knew from the outset that if I was going to find an omnibus interaction, I would do all three tetrad interactions. So I'm gonna start by comparing Shafe and Tukey critical values because I could use either of those. My hunch is that, um, I, and I'm sorry, I said Tukey and Shafe, I mean 
Bonferroni anchovy. I can't do Tukey here because these are not pairwise. So I'm going to start by comparing the critical value for Bonferroni anchovy for constructing critical values or constructing confidence intervals because whichever critical value is smaller, that's going to be the better one to use. My suspicion is Bonferroni is going to be smaller. Why? because we only have three contrast. But if we had lots of contrast, Chaffet might be smaller. But let me go ahead and enter the code to check that first. So here I've constructed the code for each of these critical values for Chaffet. It's the square root of the numerator degrees of freedom. Remember, we're focusing on interaction here, right there. And so the numerator degrees of freedom is two. And the denominator times, square root of the numerator degrees of freedom times a quantile on the F distribution. We're going to take a 0.95 for a 95% confidence. Numerator degrees of freedom, again, two, same thing. And denominator degrees of freedom, which is the degrees of freedom for the residuals, that's 54. So there's our Chaffet. For Bonferroni, we're going to use a T distribution. But instead of taking 1 minus 0.05, we're going to take 1 minus 0.05 divided by 3. And there's one more thing I need to do. I need to divide that by 2. Because whereas the F distribution, you only look at the upper tail. In the T distribution, you look at both tails. So let me go ahead and run that. And let's look over here in the environment. Bonferroni is 2.47, Chaffet is 2.52, so Bonferroni is slightly better. So that's the one that I'm going to use. So I don't even really need this now. Um, let me go ahead and just, I'll leave it in here, but I'll hide it. I'll show nothing, just run the code. So I'll hide this, but now I'm ready to move on with the calculation of those critical values and some text about those critical values. So I've entered some more code and there's a lot going on here. So let's go ahead and go through it. The first thing I'm doing is I'm calculating the variance of my contrast. Now, in order to calculate the variance of my contrast, I need to take the mean square from the residual and I need to use the weights of the contrast divided by the number of guinea pigs in that cell. So we have four cells involved in every single tetrad contrast. Tetrad means four. And there are 10 guinea pigs in each. So my weights are one, minus one, minus one, and one. But when I square those weights, I get one. One over 10, one over 10, one over 10, one over 10. So here's my contrast of my variance. To get the standard error of the contrast, I need to take the square root of that. Once I have the standard error of the contrast, which I really don't need to show those, now I can calculate Mo, the margin of error. That's the contrast standard error times the Bonferroni critical value. Once I have Mo, I can take each of my three contrasts that I calculated above, and I can now put confidence bands around them just by adding and subtracting Mo. So let me go ahead and look at those. There they are. This is for the first contrast, medium minus low, in which zero was uh, our estimate, almost zero. So no surprise that the interval looks like this. This is when we compare high minus low, and this is when we compare high minus medium. Again, those high and the medium are each themselves differences, differences between orange juice and vitamin C. So we're looking at difference of differences. One thing I notice about all these intervals is they're not very informative. They're very wide. And given the width of these intervals, there's not much information it's going to give me. I'm going to go ahead and report those because I said I would, but they're not very informative. So I need to make sure I mention that in my text. Prior to writing the text, one thing I do want to note, if you've watched previous videos, you know that when we have pairwise confidence intervals and use Bonferroni, we can do a t-test procedure, and that means we don't have to use equal variances. That is, if you use the t-test function in R, 
it does not assume equal variances. But note, we can't use the t-test function here. Why not? Because we have four groups involved, not two. Yes, we're using a t distribution in order to calculate our critical value, but that's it. We cannot use the t-test. Therefore, I've used the 13.19 for my variance, which comes from the omnibus table, which assumes homogeneity of variance. So unlike when we're looking at pairs and the Bonfroni allows us to ignore heterogeneous variances, that's not true here. Fortunately, I was pretty good. They were not, the variances were not more than a factor of four apart from each other, so I'm okay. But I'm just letting you know that if you encounter heterogeneity, you can't say here, oh, I can use Bonferroni. Not if you're doing tetrads. It does, that does not help with your heterogeneous variances. Okay, let me go ahead and put in some text to go along with all this. Um, I'm actually going to go ahead and put it in down here because I'm not going to show this. After I use this information to construct my table, then I'm going to hide all this. So my text says, I use the Bonferroni method to construct the three tetrad confidence intervals. I show these in table three. Although the sample data offer compelling evidence that orange juice should be preferred to ascorbic acid with low and medium doses, but not for high doses, when we try to infer this to a larger population, we note very wide confidence intervals that indicate much instability in our estimates. Okay, so basically I'm saying these are the confidence intervals. I'm showing you these confidence intervals, but I'm also noting that they don't tell us much in terms of inference. From the omnibus test, we are able to infer that there are differences of differences. The other thing I'll note is that you can see these tetrads. I've laid out all four means here and really focusing on what's inside these parentheses in our narrative is the best way to get that across. And I did that way back up here when I talked about the individual contrast. Okay, let's see. Um, I've used this for here. So I once I've used this, I can go ahead and say include equals false. Uh, show nothing, run the code. Let me get rid of this. And I noticed back up here that I still had some things showing here. Let's make sure that's include equals false. Yes. Um, I went ahead and put a horizontal line above and below the table to kind of separate it a little bit. Let's go ahead and knit this and see what we get. So that's what it looks like. I have a caption for table three tetrad confidence intervals for the interaction of delivery method and dose when affecting odontoblast length. If you wanted to put these in the narrative instead, you would be welcome to do that, but it gets a little bit awkward when you're having to deal with these um, long expressions here to, to show what it is that the confidence interval is for. Now you could just do it in words in the narrative, that would work out as well too, but I didn't wanna do that because the words that I wanted to use basically say these intervals are too wide to be able to make any inferences about the interaction in the population. I think I'm ready now for my conclusions. So let me do a double check here. Description analysis, figure one, table one, figure two, figure three, figure four, table two, table three. Yes, let's move on to conclusions. So here is what I wrote. Remember that what the conclusion should do is answer the research question way back up here that you talk about in the description. And so here's my answer. Dosages of vitamin C can increase the length of odontoblast, at least in guinea pigs. I analyzed data from a 1947 study and found that higher dosages of vitamin C lead to longer odontoblasts. The guinea pigs in this study exhibited odontoblasts from 8 to 26 microns with higher dosages resulting in longer odontoblasts. 
The method of delivery via orange juice or ascorbic acid was more important in lower doses than in higher doses, where delivery method did not seem to matter. These data led me to conclude with 95% confidence that an interaction does exist between dose and method of delivery, though I cannot infer specific interaction effects with my current sample size. And now I need a press release. I need to be able to say this to the public. So here's what I say. Professor Michael Seaman, a researcher from the University of South Carolina, recently released a report of his analysis of data from a 1947 study that examined the effect of vitamin C on odontoblast, a cell that is important in tooth formation. The study was conducted with 60 guinea pigs, with each guinea pig getting one of three doses of vitamin C through one of two delivery methods, orange juice or an ascorbic acid solution. These data clearly show, said Seaman, that dosages of vitamin C can increase the length of odontoblast, at least in guinea pigs. The guinea pigs in this study exhibited odontoblast from 8 to 26 microns, with higher dosages resulting in longer odontoblasts. The method of delivery via orange juice or ascorbic acid was more important than lower doses than in higher doses where delivery method did not seem to matter. What does this mean for humans? We don't know, though these data surely suggest a study of the relationship of vitamin C to tooth health in humans. If the same patterns are present in humans as in guinea pigs, with large enough doses, we can increase odontoblasts without concern over the method of delivery for these doses. And that's it. Let me go ahead and save this, knit it, look at the whole thing, make sure it looks good. Up, oh, I still have my question at the top. I need to get rid of that. I only had that as a placeholder until I wrote my report. All right, try again. I'm just scanning for formatting now. And everything looks good. So that's it. So I'm going to create one more video in this video series, and that is to give a little bit of a preview of what will happen when you work with on balance designs. As I mentioned in a previous video, I actually don't cover on balance designs very deeply in this course. I have an experimental design course that I cover it in, but I would at least like you to be aware of some of the issues since you're likely to encounter on balance designs. So I'll have one more video in which I preview that for you so that you know what to look for if you ever encounter, as you probably certainly will, an on-balance design. That is a design in which you do not have equal sample sizes in each of the conditions. So I'll see you for that final video.